when we look at learning through the lens, not only of the operational system itself, but then pairing it with those beautiful methodologies from cognitive psychology and theory. Now we've got like so many things. I call it my treasure chest because I'm a pirate, but like now we've got so many things in the treasure chest to pull from. So Lauren, welcome to the show. Um, I'm just curious to ask before before we get into this, you know, what got you interested in the science of learning and the science of the brain? There's two ways to answer that question, and they're both like as equally important. So um, I've been in learning and development uh, in the industry for well over 20 years, and I started as an educator, as a teacher. And I was at a conference one day, I was opening for another speaker and that speaker was speaking about neuroscience and learning. And I was like, oh, the brain, the thing that's doing the learning, I probably should know more about that. So that was sort of my, my entry point, like over a decade ago now, it's uh, kind of like that historical, very stereotypical moment of I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go back and learn everything I can about the brain and how to be a better instructional designer, which I was at the time, so that I could design learning for other people that's more effective. Um, and I think I, I've told you this before, but you know, when you start to learn about your brain, I equate it to Alice chasing the rabbit, but I'm Alice and the rabbit's the brain. And I just kept chasing the brain and wanting to know more and more about it. And it's quite addictive to, to sort of get the, what I call the, the pages of the operational manual of you. So that was the, the professional side. I wanted to be a better instructional designer. Um, and now, you know, eight years later, I'm now a learning scientist and, and a translator, which is amazing. But then there's the personal side, which is my grandmother who was alive at the time. She was living at Baycrest, which is part of the Rotman Research Center here in Toronto. And when I started to study medical neuroscience, it was because of her. She was deteriorating. She had Alzheimer's and I wanted to understand what's happening to her brain and, and how is she, you know, cognitively functioning and how can I connect with her more by educating myself more about the operational system itself. So it was motivated originally by my profession and then everything else that came personally just kind of merged all together. And, um, when you put it all together, it really has profoundly changed me as just a regular old human being. It sounds like you've been on quite a quite a trajectory, Lauren. Um, I'm just curious to ask, so whenever you discovered this, you said you, you gave up your your job and you just decided, right, I'm just going to go learn about this and master this and this will be my new my new path. Is that is that right? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. I couldn't. Um, it was the question I've, I've, talk, I've talked about this in keynotes and workshops and to this day when I'm still learning something new, the question that just kept coming up over and over and over again was like, how, how did I not know this? <laughs> how did I not know? I'm like, this is my brain. This is my learning. This is what I do for a living. But I just, we don't know what we don't know. And I don't know about you, Niall, but I mean, I was never given the operational manual of my brain in school. <laughs> had to learn. I think you're making such a good point there. And the books that have impacted me most it's when I've I've been reading it, and like you say, you just have that experience of like, oh my god, like like I knew this, but I'd never seen it put into words before. No one had ever explained it, but it's something things we implicitly know, but we're like, yeah, it takes someone else to articulate it. You know, it's unbelievable how intuitive some of these things are, but as you just so beautifully articulated, until we learn about it and sort of put the puzzle pieces together, you might know what you're doing, but you might not know why you're doing it. So as someone who is and has been responsible for, for a very long time to create learning for other people, I could go back in my earlier career as, you know, when I was teaching and say, oh, I was already intuitively designing the way that I thought I should be for the brain, but I didn't know why. So now that I do know more about the mechanism itself, it just, it's so cool. At the same time, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so much more challenging when you are taking into consideration how do we optimize the operational system by designing learning more effectively for it. A hundred percent. And you know, what would you say are the the benefits of learning how to learn? Like what kind of impact can this have in somebody's life if they learn how the brain works and how the brain encodes information and these different things? Oof, 
Um, so let's let's break this down sort of to those two components again. So we can look at it from we are human beings and we are human learners, right? So we already know how to learn. We are physically designed, our brains are designed and meant for us to continually learn. Otherwise, we'd probably still be crawling on the floor and, and food wouldn't make it accurately into our mouths. So <laughs> we're, we're designed to learn. So it's not about learning how to learn, it's about learning how to learn better because we already know how to do it. It's just, I think when we look at historically our habits and our behaviors and where we learned those, those, well, it came from mostly our educational experiences in school. And I think when that system had started, they weren't really thinking about what's the most intentional and strategic and methodical way that we can do this. And what do we know about the brain? Well, no, that was 200 years ago. They didn't care. <laughs> it was, we need to teach people so they can get out and they can work for us. That was the objective of, of school back then. So when we look at, you know, fast forward now, it's when we look at learning through the lens, not only of the operational system itself, but then pairing it with those beautiful methodologies from cognitive psychology and theory. Now we've got like so many things, I call it my treasure chest because I'm a pirate, but like now we've got so many things in the treasure chest to pull from. So from a human learning level, we become more intentional and we become more cognitively aware of the process of how we were going about our learning. And that's called, uh, metacognition. That's part of the theory of being metacognitive. And it's incredibly powerful from just the everyday you and me learn and now human standpoint, then it becomes a matter of, well, if I can be more consciously aware of my thought processes, then maybe I can also be consciously aware of what I'm feeling and what I am feeling in my emotions and my behavior and my body. And it becomes a very powerful tool just for your everyday life. I always like to use the example of, um, you know, when you're sort of frantic, when you're like, you're late to get somewhere and you're running around your, your place and you're like, oh, I got my keys, I got my phone, I got my wallet, oh, I'm late, someone calls me. And you can run around your house for, you know, an extra five to 10 minutes, or you can realize that there's, no, I'm, I'm working on a very emotional response right now that is not serving me, which means that my executive function, that thing that's going to help me get out the door is completely offline. <laughs> and if I can recognize that, then I can be like, take a breath, calm down. Hey, by the way, your keys are in your hand. <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> That's a that's a really good example. And you mentioned uh, metacognition there, Lauren. Um, mm -hmm. For anybody that hasn't heard of what metacognition is, could you maybe, how would you describe that to somebody for the first time in very, very simple terms? So there's a couple of ways I love to describe this. Um, so metacognition is, if you Google it, you probably, the first thing that would come up, it would be, um, is thinking about thinking. And to me, that's just kind of confusing. <laughs> so the way that I like to describe metacognition is, it's your ability to become the audience to your own performance. I love, I just, I like, yeah, becoming the audience to your own performance. And again, we can divide this into sort of two aspects of it, right? So we've got your ability to monitor it, and then you've got your ability to sort of regulate and, and do something about it. So when we look at what's called, you know, meta knowledge, meta, metacognitive knowledge is the knowledge that you have of your own cognitive process. And then it's your ability to not only know what that is, but to monitor it, to reflect on it, but also can you catch yourself making errors? Can you catch yourself when you're, you know, when you need to shift a little bit? So that first process is really about the meta knowledge. What do you know about your own cognitive processes? Now, when it comes to learning, most of us haven't thought about this before. <laughs> We don't think, you know, we don't think very intentionally and strategically about how am I going to go methodically about the way that I learn and what is my process? Well, most people these days will be like, um, okay, well, I'll grab a book and I'll highlight and I'll find this thing on YouTube. And maybe there's a TikTok on that. Maybe there's an Instagram story, <laughs> you know, and, and we just go down these rabbit holes of probably curiosity, which is wonderful. It means that you're motivated. We need motivation when we want to learn, but it's almost like you're trying to, it's like you're trying to grab, you know what this image of my mind is coming to right now is those old game shows where you, you're put in a box 
and all these dollar bills start flying around you and you just want to grab as much as you can. <laughs> That's kind of, if you're going about your learning with like really not knowing how you're doing it, you're just kind of trying to grab at things, but not really hold on to anything firmly. So that meta knowledge really is important so that you understand how do I go about this? How am I going to monitor this as I go on? And then the other side of that is then the control part. So let's say I know what my process is. I'm going to be able to detect those. I can monitor my errors and I can watch, you know, what my efforts are, but then where am I going to put in some meta control? So how am I going to correct those errors when they come up? Hmm. And how am I going to sort of allocate my, my resources more consciously? So there's, a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Okay. Okay. So there's loads in there, um, but I want to try and make this practical for people listening. Okay. So let's imagine, let's imagine Lauren that I came to you and I said, okay, so you're, you help people design learning. That's kind of your, mm-hmm. your expertise. Um, how you might, if I, if I came to you and said, Lauren, I, I really want to learn Spanish, um, but I have no idea where to start. You know, how would you go about helping me design a, uh, a learning process with these principles from metacognition in mind? Ooh, this is delicious. So learning a language as we get older becomes increasingly difficult because the language um, centers in our brain, especially those that represent our native tongue, they develop very young, right? So Mm. when we learn a language as an adult, we're competing against these networks of our native tongue and trying to put more in there and it's kind of competing against it, right? So that's why it's very challenging to learn a new language um, as we get older. When we are, you know, and I think this is not just for language learning, we can apply the, this sort of methodology to, to most of our learning, is when we look at the theory of metacognition, there's three components that I like to talk about. The first one is, what are the things that you know with certainty? What is it that you know? So maybe if you're learning Spanish, you know, my vocabulary is actually pretty good, but can I put a sentence together? Is my grammar great? Well, no. So Am I going to waste my time or not waste, but am I going to allocate my time to learning more vocabulary, which I have a good handle on, or am I going to allocate my time to learning that structure so I can use that? So that's sort of that first, like, okay, identify what is it that I know? And then it's, well, what don't I know then? Okay, well, I don't know how to put it in, into structure. So, and I can use my own example. You're, I know that I, you're probably, you were learning Spanish back in the day. I was learning Japanese because I was living in Japan. That's a whole, that, that was a very big challenge, but probably like most, I sat there with a dictionary. I created my own dictionary of words that I wanted to know. And then I realized, oh gosh, the Japanese language is completely backwards from English. <laughs> I need, I don't have no structure. So I identify what I know, what I don't know. Then as I'm learning, this is the this is the one where we really get caught up and where we really need to pay attention. It's what you think you know. And this is why we have to be not only more intentional and strategic with the time that we're learning, but we can't look at learning anymore as a one and done. We can't just look at some part of it and go, I think I've got that, I'll move on now. We constantly have to come back. And I know we'll probably talk a little bit about memory. And we constantly have to come back because if we don't catch ourselves in those moments where I thought I knew, I actually don't know. (laughs) I'll give you a really great example. When I was working in in Japan um, in in my early teaching years, I was learning vocabulary. I wanted to be able to speak to my students and to their parents and whatnot. And uh, I I don't know if we have any, um, if we'll have any Japanese listeners, they might find this very amusing, but there's two words in Japanese that are very similar. One is kowaii which means scary. And the other one is kawaii, which means cute. And when a parent was asking me, how's your child doing? I was like, ah, kawaii, kawaii. And I was telling you, they're terrifying me. (laughs) 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 Until eventually someone corrected me. It was like, can you stop telling parents that their children are scaring you? I'm like, oh my God, what am I saying? They're like, no, no, no. It's kawaii. I'm like, oh my gosh. So not only had I, I was determined to, to fix my pronunciation, but I convinced myself that I actually knew. And so I had moved on from that sort of learning of that vocabulary. And I think we have a tendency to do that. We like to rush through our learning instead of actually looking back and going, do I actually know that with certainty? 
have I encoded the right memory of this mm. or do I just think I have? That's fascinating. Um, we're just going back to the, you know, it's what, it's not what you know that gets you. There's a quote from Mark Twain. It's like, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so or something like that there. So it's this, anyway. Sounds um, like a song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so just going through those those steps broadly again. So you first define what you what know, you know? Mm -hmm. then you define what you don't know. Yeah. And then you, def you define what you think you know that might not be true. Is that the third one? Yeah. And I'd say when it comes to what you think, you know, this is where, when you're, you know, those, those are where you want to focus a little bit more, but then as you're continuing your learning, you want to revisit those things. You, co you constantly want to revisit it, right? Because when the brain thinks that it already knows something, it's going to bypass it. And I, I don't know any one of my scientists who I work with who will tell you that learning is easy. It's not, but we want to think that it is. But when we look at learning from the, from the inside out, which is what I often do, you have to physically, there's physical things in this beautiful brain of ours that's changing. There's structural changes that are happening. So for us to think that that's just like, oh, no, pull a magic wand, it's done. <laughs> it, it's, it just doesn't work that way. And for anybody who's listening or watching, um, I would definitely encourage you. One thing that really changed the game for me when I started uh, my explorations into learning and the brain and all the science was, and you don't have to get too gruesome or too gory, but when you see the brain itself on a, on a very, um, it's neuroimaging level. So if you're looking at fMRI or MRI and you can see the brain moving around and these networks and these neurons firing, it really does humble you as a human being and as a human learner, because you recognize wow, there's a lot going on up there. And there's a lot that needs to change in here in order for me to produce a tangible result out there. I, I, I think there's there's so much power in what you're saying. And also this awareness that learning isn't supposed to be easy. You know, like if you yeah. if you have the awareness that, you know, this is, potent, this is going to be an uncomfortable process because you're basically like, you know, you're taking this new information and you're, you're building, I don't know if this is the right way to say or not, but you're building new neural, neural networks almost, or you're adding to yeah. your existing ones. Yeah. So just having the awareness that it's going to feel a bit difficult. If you know that upfront, then it's going to help you to get through the, the hard parts and actually follow through. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's definitely fair to say, because when you when you look at the structure of how, you know, and, and you know, I know that uh, a lot of your your listeners, they'll, they'll know a little bit about this already. But for those who don't, when we look at what the brain is actually composed of, these beautiful neurons that we have, of which there are billions, there are billions of these tiny, tiny little circles in there. And the way that we're learning is through these these growth structures called dendrites that look like gorgeous tree branches. And if you look at this, um, I like to show these when I'm doing keynotes and workshops, because first of all, it's mesmerizing to see what's happening in the brain, but then you'll never look at a tree. I guaranteed you go look at a bare tree. You'll never see it the same way. Again. You'll just see these tree branches of knowledge of experience that grow They're They're growing. And this is what, what makes those networks that you're talking about. And our ability to learn is really those, those, um, changes that we are growing those specific tree branches, those dendrites at very specific neurons, and then at very specific synapses. And the synapses are very, very, very tiny structures. So what's, what's always remarkable to me about explaining this is that when you think we've got 86 billion of these cells in our brain approximately, and attached to each one of those, you have roughly between five, I think up to five to 10 at most um, of these like tree branches, these dendrites. Okay. So times that by 86 billion, billion, we're already at an astronomical number. Now, now we know that we've got up to thousand of these tiny synapses. I like to look at it. Um, I, I, I like to describe this is if you think of a synapse visually is if you were to take your hand and you were to cover it in cake frosting, and then you dipped it in sprinkles, the sprinkles were, would represent these synapses where chemical transmissions are happening in the brain. And there's trillions of those. <laughs> Trill this is all in three pounds of something that's no bigger than your two hands put together, roughly. <laughs> so this essence of learning from the inside out is really about that creation and the destruction and the movement and the shape of these 
neurons and these synapses and the remapping and the recreation of these pathways in response to the new stimuli. And in, of course, in response to the, the practice and the repetition that we do. It's incredible. Isn't it's, it? it's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> Um, what do we know about learning throughout the lifespan? Um, can people continue to build these these new uh, networks throughout um, uh, until old age? Is there a decline mm -hmm. at some point? Like what what do we what do we know about that based on the latest research? There is, I mean, there is decline. I mean, and I you know what's funny is sometimes I avoid reading the the research on um, sort of how the brain changes and, and what happens as we get older because I'm getting older and I'm not sure I want to know yet so <laughs> but yes there there is going to be that you know a bit of decline but everything that we know it's not just about you know learning is a powerful tool to keep strength in your brain right we want to challenge it we want to try new things we want to keep ourselves educated and in whatever respects that could be whether that's taking up a hobby um I want to take up dance right now. I've heard the late, you know, a, a great amount of research showing, um, you know, so many wonderful things happen in the brain through obviously music, but through dance and movement and that coordination. But there is going to be a decline as we get older. And I think from a culmination of healthy diet, as we know, regular sleep, hydration, exercise is imperative to memory. Um, Dr. Uh, Wendy, Wendy Suzuki, she, she has a, a vast amount uh, wonderful research on the implications of exercise and uh, memory as we as we age. And can we, you know, can you teach a dog? What was it? Can you teach an old dog new tricks? Is that the old saying? Yeah, of course you can. But I, I think that what happens is, and um, I actually haven't finished reading. I'm, I'm just in the midst of reading a, a new review paper on cognitive control. And where I find, I, I'm like, oh, there's hope as I get older, is there are certain organizational patterns in the brain that become stronger as we get older. And surprisingly for people that are younger, they're not as strong. So we're looking at things like the way um, is called schemas and the way that the brain organizes information and the strength of our working memory. There's hope, but I think for me, it's about how do I keep my brain engaged and stimulated and challenged, right? If learning is hard, well, then I want to keep doing it so that I can be one of those people that I see on YouTube or the evening news at 99 years old and still swing dancing or equestrian riding a bike or I think one of them did acrobatics, which was very impressive. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. No, I'm, I'm reading this book uh, by Arthur Brooks at the moment. It's called From Strength mm -hmm. to Strength. And he talks about the, there's two different types of intelligence. There's fluid intelligence, which is essentially, you know, it's analysis, it's creativity. It's coming up with sort of new fresh insights innovations and things and then there's this crystallized intelligence and this is all around synthesizing information it's it's teaching it's uh often you know sharing with others and yeah. the fluid intelligence apparently declines with age whereas crystallized intelligence tends to go up so his whole book is all around like in the second half of life it's like you should be optimizing for the crystallized intelligence as opposed to fluid intelligence because if you try to hang on to that you're sort of fighting mm. a losing battle it was an interesting perspective um partly disheartening but also quite encouraging as well um, well it's there's again i find when it comes to the science and and what we learn and how we learn it you know this is i, I just gave uh i just gave a talk on uh, on this with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of people and and we were talking about like these declines and you know, what happens, what doesn't happen. And, you know, where, where I thought was really beautiful is there was a study done of, I think it was 25 or 30 couples as they were getting older. And because they were able to share the memory, they share memory. Mm. They each have their own brains, but they share the memory. And that's why they'll be telling these stories of things that happened 25, 30 years ago. And, you know, the, the one partner will go, oh, yes, we were at the cinema down on Young Street. And she'll be like, oh, actually, no, that was on Bloor. Oh, yes, it was Bloor. <laughs> 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 so I guess, you know, it's, it's if you have, and I don't think that you necessarily have to have, you know, a, a life a life partner, but like even your friends, people that you you do have these sort of like shared memories with. We can sort of fill in those gaps as we as we get older, which is which is really sort of sweet. I loved that study. It was just very sweet to watch all of these couples fill in the blanks of of all of these wonderful experiences that they had had. 
it's, it's such a human thing as well. Like whenever I get together with old friends that I haven't seen mm. in, you know, 10 years, we, the first thing we do is we talk about all the, the memories that we shared together back, back around that time, you know, Lauren, now I'd like to sort of get into some of the, some of the strategies people can use to, to maybe learn more effectively things like mm. interleaving space repetition, mm. these sorts of topics. Like if you any, any sort of things that you can share with people that might be beneficial for improving their learning that way. Yeah, I think the first thing that I would encourage people to do, like how we started this conversation, is to look how you're going about it right now. Like, really have a good think about what are my strategies, what are my methods as I'm as I am learning, and and then sort of make a make a good note or a good list of those somewhere. Um, one of the uh, the I guess one of the strongest protocols when it comes to metacognition was to keep a learning journal. And this is something that I do. Um, I mean, we know generally journaling is, is a wonderful thing just to extract things from your own mind. But when it comes to strategic learning, to keep a learning journal, excuse me, journal, and to track, you know, what was my method? What's working? What's not working? Um, do I need to go revisit back something? That has been um, now proven to be one of the strongest metacognitive protocols, you know, that we can use. So grab a journal, track your learning, see what, like just the same way that you would probably, you know, if you were going on a diet or if you're tracking calories, like why not track your learning as well? So that's one thing that people can do. And then let's go into, so you, you mentioned um, interleaving and things like space repetition. Now these are, these are really interesting uh, methods that you can use. Now, typically what we'll do is we'll do a mass practice. This is how we are all I, not all, I'll say the vast majority of us, if you're anything like me, you went to school, um, you had a textbook and you had a test or an exam coming up in like three weeks and you would mass practice. You would cram and read. And if you were like me, you're at the coffee shop to like three in the morning, the day before the test. <laughs> and, uh, and no amount of highlighting was going to get me, you know, the long-term results that I wanted. So when we talk about space repetition, when you want to use it correctly, you're reviewing your materials, but in smaller bits, and you're increasing mm. the intervals of time. Now, okay. why is this beneficial? There is so much beautiful research now that shows us that uh, the part, one part of your brain, now memory is consolidated in multiple different parts of your brain, but a more sort of well-researched one is the hippocampal area for long-term memory. Now, there's been papers that have shown that there's repetitions that ha happen when we space out or when we take these pauses. Now, some of the times it's for, and it, it's really, Niall, it's going to depend on the type of learning that you're doing as well. If you're learning how to play tennis versus learning how to learn a language, well, you're going to go, you're going to approach it just a little bit differently. But when we space things out, we're allowing the process of how the brain is going to encode a memory to happen. We're working with that process. And memory consolidates while we are sleeping or while we are in deep rest. So you can see how the traditional learning might not have really worked for us, right? It's like sit in a classroom for eight hours of the day, go to sleep, and then we move on to something else. We've forgotten most of what we thought we learned the day before. So when we space it out and we give ourselves those smaller chunks of, of times, but we increase the intervals between and giving ourselves that rest, that's when those beautiful structures in our brain can do what it needs to do to help us encode that memory. And then we want to basically make sure we're practicing and rehearsing because in the practice and the rehearsal, that's when we are strengthening the network. So if you think of learning as sort of the, the way that we just if, remember all those cells, all those neurons, if we're stamping those neurons to be like, we want you to remember this, then when we are repeating, when we're rehearsing, that's when we are strengthening the connection. I described it earlier to, to someone as, I'm not sure if you ever did this when you were a kid, but those um, connect the dots, those like you had those connect the dot um, things, or and just picture like a connect the dot on your page. Well, you've got all of these random dots. Those are your neurons. Those are the cells. And we want to connect those dots to fire together what we want them to, to create and produce the tangible memory of the skill, the ability, the behavior but we have to keep practicing. So space it out, do it a little bit, you know, increase your time intervals, try not to mass practice because then you're just getting more of an instant performance than you are a long-term learning. So be aware of that. So that's one sort of big one that we can sort of work against the system of what we were taught. <laughs> 
That's uh, I think that's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, with have you heard of this thing called elaboration? Where the I think it's from that guy Peter Brown. He wrote the book. Or he wrote the book. It's called The Science of Learning. I'm not sure, but mm. the idea is basically that the mo- one of the most effective ways to get new knowledge into your brain is to link it with existing knowledge. So if you're learning something new and you're you're writing about it after or you're explaining to others, you should always try try and find a way to link it with something you already know because that neural network is already there and then you're sort of just like linking the new knowledge onto the neural network so it's sort of like hitching a ride on the the neurons are already there does that make sense is that do you think that's it yeah i mean it okay so it makes sense to to a certain degree so this is where um we want to look at sort of the the way that the brain does organize organized information now there are structures and frameworks they're called schemas schemas, I think that the word goes back as far, it was uh, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick Bartlett. And this is like back in the 1930s, right? He came up with this, uh, this theory, it was schema theory. And he basically described it as a structure that people use to organize their current knowledge, but then provide a framework for their future understanding. Now, how this organization of your knowledge affects new learning is obviously critical is for to understand how we learn, how we remember new information. So what we have to be careful about is, yes, we can, it's called scaffolding. We can build upon the knowledge that we have, build upon that architecture that we've already got. But then we have to be careful because the pre-existing schemas in your brain will determine how you remember and comprehend something to come. Mm. And this can work against us, Right. Because if the brain thinks that it already knows something and it fits, if it thinks, oh, it fits into this category or this organizational pattern, it's going to bypass it. It's just going to put it in there. Um, there was a uh, a really interesting, this I think it's back in the 70s, they did some really cool experiments back in the 70s. But this one study that proved that sort of demonstrated this was, um, it was uh, two scientists, Brewer and Trevins, Trevins, I believe that's correct. Yeah. Um, and they set up this experiment where these people walked into an office setting and there were things that you would typically see in an office. There were things that you wouldn't see in an office. Now they didn't know that the experiment was them being in this office. And when they came out, they were asked to recall, what did you remember? Now they remembered most of the things that you would typically see in an office. Some of them made up things that weren't even there (laughs) because, you know, they expected to see it. So while the brain will sort of, you know, the schemas will will help us to recall certain things. At other times, it's going to overlook, it's going to forget things that don't fit into that category. So we have to be very focused when we're learning to make sure that we're not sort of allowing those networks and schemas to override the thing that we really need to learn now, the new stuff. Wow. Wow. Okay. And this actually reminds me of a quote from Bruce Lee. I remember hearing like years ago, but it sort of stuck with me. It was something like, I can't remember the, the full quote, but it was something like real learning is unlearning. And I'm just curious, have you thought much <laughs> about, have you thought much about the process of unlearning, whether it's, is that even possible or whenever we learn something, is it always just there? You know, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? There's been a good, really good debate over that one. This, um, I think there's a lot of people who have a, have a bit of a, a bone to pick with the, the term unlearning because is it unlearning? Is it relearning? I just say, well, it's learning, right? When we, I think it's this re-manipulation of the structures, right? It's those changes that we can't see happening in the brain itself. And I see that's where I see it from is if I'm relearning something, then something's changing in there. If I'm quote unquote unlearning something, well, something's changing in there to represent that. So I know that there is, um, I know I, I've used it too in the past is sometimes we need to unlearn to, to learn. But now that I can see inside of this thing, I can, all I see is those connect the dots. I'm like, oh, those dots are moving. They're just reconnecting to a different different pattern so that I can learn something new. Very interesting. Now, you've got a sort of a, obviously, it's, I don't think it's your process, but you've got a three-step process for, for memory and how you, how memory works. Can you maybe tell us about what that is? It's just a, a very general way that, that I tend to, to go about describing because memory is so complicated. <laughs> like most things in the brain, it's incredibly complicated. But it's, the first part is 
So I'll tell you the three. It's encode, store, and retrieve. So we're looking at the first process of encoding. And when we're encoding something, it's that time where we really are focusing our cognitive energy on new learning. So we really have to be, first of all, focused. Focus is our gateway to learning. And focus isn't easy, as we all know. It's a skill we all need to, to work on. But that's the sort of that encoding process. When I'm taking in new stimuli, and that's when I'm sort of expending the most energy with my brain. Then we go on to um, the storage process. Now, storage is when we are taking something from that short-term working memory and we're trying to move it into our long-term memory, which means we have to do the reversal. We have to do the repetition. This is when you can use those um, methodologies like the spaced repetition, um, interleading, which is another technique which, which challenges the brain to retrieve information in, in different pattern ways. But that second piece of encode store, the storage is critical to getting to the last process, which is the retrieval practice, is retrieval, excuse me. And once we get to retrieval, hopefully by that point, you have encoded it as the long-term memory and we can retrieve it with ease. So encode, store, retrieve. Encode is when you're doing the heavy lifting, store is when you're doing the repetition and you're rehearsing to like strengthen those networks. And retrieval is hopefully by then you've got it in there and you can transfer it. Wow, okay, that's that simplifies it so much. So. Oh, learning <laughs> but it's a, it's a useful model and so what we're saying here is learning essentially requires two kind of core elements i suppose um well maybe three but it's this upfront where this upfront uh time whenever you're intensely focusing giving it mm -hmm. your full attention you know mm -hmm. you're giving your full conscious effort it requires that but then for it to be to be consolidated and for it to go into long-term memory, you need this, you need the rest, you need the recovery, you need what that's when these connections are actually forming. So if you don't sleep and if you don't get proper rest between your learning sessions, then you're not giving those, your brain a chance to sort of strengthen those neural networks. Yeah, it's doing, it's a, one of the coolest things um, when I was doing, this is like years ago and I, it stuck with me to this day is when um, we're sleeping and when it comes to memory, and I'm not sure if I'm going to quote this accurately, but it's like, it said, sleep is the only time that you are remembering and forgetting at the same time. I was like, wow, <laughs> that just like blows my mind, pun intended, but like, see, and it's true. You're remembering and you're forgetting at the same time. So yes, yeah, sleep is in, is incredibly important to, to this process. Um, but focus during the learning, that is really the key. And I think this is very hard for most of us these days. Um, focus is a skill. And I think it's a skill that we, we neglect until we realize, no, I have to actually sit down and focus. And then you realize that you're getting distracted by a million different things around you or your mind starts to wander and, and all of these other things happen. Now, everything that we have talked about thus far, you know, we've got working memory, we've got metacognition, we've got all these me methods, they don't work well without our own cognitive control. So I would say that one of the best things that we could do for ourselves is to learn how to focus. And that might be going into meditative states and practicing, you know, being in the, in the present moment, because, you know, that would help <laughs> knowing that I'm paying attention to something. Um, something that I did when I was, um, and maybe and someone else would try this is I would literally have a post-it note on my laptop or somewhere where I could see it in my visual field that says, where is your attention? Where mm -hmm. is your attention? Because attention is your mechanism to focus. So by looking at that, I'm like, oh, my attention's on this post-it right now. <laughs> Or, or I, was thinking, I was thinking something else, but if you ask yourself that is like, where's my attention that will, that's guiding where your focus is. So it's a little sort of a, a little thing that you can help to sort of train yourself to understand where my attention goes. My focus is really going to be like, that's what, what is driving my focus. So you don't need to meditate. Meditation is a wonderful way to, to regulate our emotional processing centers and to help us to, to get into that focus. Um, there's other tips, binaural beats, the recent paper, um, 40 Hertz, 40 H said pure binaural beats. So if you're thinking about going onto YouTube and just looking at binaural beats, they have to be pure. Um, and we want to listen to them 30 minutes before we start burning. 
right? So it's kind of like tuning. Oh man, this is going to show my age. Anyone who's actually physically watching this, I'm doing, uh, I'm turning my hand as if there was a radio dial. <laughs> But like you want to get on the right frequency, right? So sometimes it takes your brain has to warm up to get into that focus and onto that frequency. So 30 minutes of 40, uh, 40 hertz. Um, but the way that you can sort of also work with yourself before you sit down to learn, if you don't have that 30 minutes, take 30 seconds, 30 seconds to a minute and stare at one thing that could be your screen. That could be the wall, the door, whatever it is, but try to help your brain get into that focus mode by just staring at something for 30 seconds to a minute. You're going to find that it's probably a lot harder than you think it is. You're probably going to be sitting there going, oh, is it 30 seconds over yet? <laughs> uh -huh. But then the more that you practice, you might actually enjoy dropping in. You can enjoy dropping into focus. Um, sometimes now when I do that, when I'm starting to do something, whether it be work or learning, research, I almost want to like bypass the 30 seconds. Like, okay, ready. I want to go. I want to get into this. Like, I'm excited. Let's do this. But I still sort of hold back and, and practice that myself. So 30 seconds to a minute or the 30 minutes to the 40 hertz of binaural beats. Um, there's lots of research now on brown noise and pink noise that you can look into. Um, there's, you know, create the environment for you to best be able to focus is what it comes down to. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. For years, I've been using this thing called... Uh... It's like three hour focus music. It's like a three hour long YouTube video and it's like binaural beats. But whenever I hear it, I immediately just drop into like a very mm. relaxed, focused state of mind. And I don't know the research behind or whatever, but it works for me. You know, it's it's really powerful. Um, For anybody that would like to be able to focus for longer periods, in addition to what we've already talked about, you know, the, the binaural beats and, you know, having the right environment and stuff. Is there anything people can do to extend their ability to focus? And what do you think the limits are to how long we can actually focus for without needing a break? Um, I believe, and I'd have to to validate this, but I believe what the the current research was that we're we're good for about ninety minutes at a time. Okay, which is actually a pretty good amount of time. But sure. that's not to say, and it's funny because it's not to say that you you kind of won't kind of wander off a little bit, but it's your ability to come back. Mm. That's really what makes the difference, and. I think where we tend to work against ourselves, we work against our brain sometimes is in that pushing and that forcing of, oh, but I have to get this done. Oh, but I have to, you know, and think about where you're at when you're in that state of mind. So if we need our executive function, if we need our executive function to not only to help us to focus, but to do that problem solving and to sort of look at those, um, those goal related behaviors, but if our emotional processing centers, that gorgeous amygdala of ours, if the amygdalas are overactive and they're getting you to a state of a higher stress response, well, we're taking the executive function offline. Mm. But if we sit there going, oh, but I have to get this done, but I have to get this done. No, get up. It's okay. Get up. It's still going to be there in a few minutes, but like do yourself a justice by step out, take a breath, go get some water. If you haven't stood up in more than 20 minutes, you definitely want that blood back up to your brain and out of your butt. <laughs> so just take, take that minute. I think we live in such a, a, a fast paced world that we think that we have to keep pushing through when really we're just working against ourselves when we do that. That's very, that's very well said. We, we actually had a, an interview with a lady called Tamara Russell. She, she's written a lot on the neuroscience of mindfulness. And she's saying mm -hmm. the real benefit of meditation is that, you know, whenever you're, you know, you're focusing and you're bringing your attention to the breath. It's not the, it's not that you're, you know, you, you're able to do that unbroken for 30 minutes, whatever. It's, it's noticing whenever your mind has gone off and then bringing it back. And that is applicable to whenever you need to focus on something for a 90 minute period or whatever, where you can, uh, you can bring your attention back and you've got more um, executive control over it, you know? Yeah. I like to, you know, you know, it's, I love, obviously, I love science. Um, sometimes I joke that science ruins my life, though, right? Because every time I learn something new, um, this new, uh, I think, um, from, from the Huberman Lab and the Huberman Podcast, the latest one on hydration, it's like, okay, eight ounces, I think it was eight or 12 ounces of water every hour. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I need to do that. Okay, wake up, look at the sunlight because it helps to set my circadian rhythm. <laughs> turn the blue, you know, turn, get your blue light glasses on and don't, and shut the lights down at eight o'clock because that also helps and make sure you're getting good enough. Oh man. 
it's the the arsenal of science, but um, you know, it really does work. But I think that you can you can pick and choose which ones are most reasonable for you in your life. <laughs> I personally like, you know, and I think where it all kind of comes to to the center for me, I really do believe that those metacognitive abilities that I have now that I didn't have before are some of the best superhuman powers I could ever have, both for learning and for the everyday life. So that when I recognize that I'm, I've activated some sort of a stress response mm -hmm. and it's, I, I, I can drop, I can drop in and go, Ooh, Lauren, um, your heart rate's increasing. Um, your body temperature seems to be getting a bit warm and you're getting pretty mad in your thoughts. Okay. Downregulate that. What's your method to downregulate? So the breath, breath is beautiful. We know that it works absolutely fantastic to, to downregulate. And it's that simple, but it's not that simple because without the awareness to the, the, the current moment, the present moment, we're just going at high speed. And then we are down that rabbit hole of like, no, I want to be stressed out right now. I've got so much learning to do. I got a test tomorrow. I haven't done my grocery shopping. Dinner isn't made. <laughs> and by executive function, <laughs> I'll see you when I get back from my emotional vacation. <laughs> <laughs> That is, uh, you know, that that's so so important and so difficult. You know, there's a there's a couple of sort of approaches in psychology that are very good for having like broad models for this. One's compassion focused therapy, so basically divides your nervous system into three systems. It's like the soothing system where you're calm and relaxed and you you feel feel safe. There's the drive system where you're like out seeking. You know, you're out like you're trying to achieve things. And then there's a the threat system where you feel like you're in danger. You know, and just knowing or having a a broad awareness that you're in that like the threat system or whatever can help you to go okay i need to um i need to breathe here or whatever but it's hard like it's it it's hard to do in the moment you know well the the funny aspect when it comes to learning is that there is an initial you know there's a harmonization that happens right so when um when we're looking at sort of the neurochemistry of this all is there are certain things that are stimulated like norepinephrine right which is like adrenaline and we all, we, we do want certain amounts of that. We really do. But then we also want the bit of the acetylcholine, which is, you know, a, again, a, neuro, a neurotransmitter that's going to help us to focus. But how do we balance these things? And um, in, in, in the designs that I do in the series that I created, um, I'm like, well, how, how can I just stimulate that little bit of, of adrenaline in someone? I know I'm going to go scare them. <laughs> I didn't downregulate them afterwards. I'm like, well, we can't just, I can't go around scaring everybody when they want to go learn something. <laughs> so, but we have to be aware of the fact that because learning is hard, we are stimulating that little bit of that stress response, but that neurochemistry actually serves us. Mm. We want that little bit, right? And that's kind of showing us is that in that stress response and that sitting down, maybe you get a little bit of a nervous tension or you get that sort of like, oh, moment, right? But then it's our job to be like, all right, 30 seconds, I can do this, focusing, going to downregulate that response, get my focus on, on task, and I'm going to use this to just enjoy the learning. I know it's going to be hard, but you know what? I want to enjoy the hardness of it. Yeah, bring on that challenge because what I call, I call it um, going from the moment of grr, which is like my, my moment of frustration to my moment of yar which is the, you are really ready. Yeah. I'm like, I know this, I got this. Yes. Let's do it. Moment of yar. So enjoy the moments of grr that get you to the moments of yar. I love that. I love that. So just wrapping up here now, Lauren, um, for someone listening to this, that really, you know, they're really sort of keen to, um, take charge of their learning process and become like a really effective learner. What are some practical things that you'd recommend that they do after after hearing this interview well i think just to summarize some of the things that we spoke about is to you know look at your processes and look at your methodologies and how you strategically approach it and and be really honest with yourself about that too right is you know you might you might go into sitting and writing a learning journal and go I do this and this and this, but just be honest with yourself because you probably don't. <laughs> that's, that's the first one is 
just do a little detective work. Be, become your own best learning scientist, right? And just do a little detective work about how am I approaching it? And is this the best way for me in this moment to do this? So have sort of your arsenal of, of you know, tools and methods ready to go. And then keep track of those things. You know, that was that. And then remember, constantly go back and challenge yourself. And, and do I actually know this? Do I actually know this? And you're not going to know that unless you go back and revisit it, or you try to teach it to somebody else, or you try to execute it and, and demonstrate it. Um, getting other people involved in your learning, social learning is incredibly powerful. We need feedback. We need feedback because otherwise we're just, we're, we're basically measuring ourselves on ourselves. <laughs> so, so you can still quiz yourself if it's um, more of your, um, your knowledge-based learning, but don't, don't take for granted the fact that, you know, we do need feedback from other people. So get other people involved in your learning. And, and that in itself might be a little uncomfortable, but welcome, welcome to the joy and the picker and the yards and everything. So analyze what it is that you're doing right now. Get more strategic about it. Make time, make intentional time. Learning shouldn't be something that always, we can do learning passively, but if you really want to help your brain to encode those networks that will be a memory, make time for it. That's very wise words. Um, and you are currently working on a very exciting new project, which is basically helping people to, to learn more effectively. Can you tell us a bit more about this and what, how people can, um, yeah, how can they check it out online? Oh, this is really cool. Um, so I think you're talking about joining forces with your brain. Um, joining forces with your brain has been something that I've been working on for years and it's finally coming to fruition. It is a learning, it's an interactive learning journey. So I'm not going to call it a course. Um, some people want me to call it a course. It's, if you want to call it a course, fine. But this is an interactive, ongoing learning journey. So if we're going to, hold true to what science is, then, then we're going to release this in, you know, in spaces. We're going to bring this out little by little. And Joining Forces with Your Brain is a series put together by myself and a board of advisors, all scientists, to teach people about the brain, how it learns from the inside out. Um, and we're pairing that with some of the things that we talked about today. How do we cultivate that beautiful skill of focus? What are the methods that we can do? Let's look into metacognition a little bit more and develop those skills. And this is just going to be an ongoing learning series that will not only give you the knowledge, but it's up, basically upskilling you in your abilities to learn better. Wow. Wow. That's, that sounds incredible. Um, I'm really excited to check this out whenever it launches. And, you know, there's nothing more important than, I think it was Tony Buzin said, you know, um, there's nothing more important, important than learning how to learn, because if you can do that, it makes everything else in life easier. You know, it's like the most mm -hmm. important skill you could ever develop. And your course is going to be like a, a crash course in, in doing that based on the, the latest scientific research with from some of the, you know, the, the best and brightest in the field. So that's fascinating. And uh, just one more question to wrap up. Are there any books or any other resource in addition you'd recommend that would be it'd be helpful for someone that would like to, uh, to develop this capacity further? Hmm. Um, you know, one of the first books that I ever picked up when I, when I started was, um, David, David A. Sousa, S-O-U-S-A. He has a series of books, I believe now on how the brain learns. And I, I thought they, they were a great entry point. So David A. Sousa, how the brain learns, um, Barbara Oakley, was uh, most famously known uh, to do the learning how to learn course. And, and that just absolutely blew up. I am a big fan. I love Barbara. Um, and so I would also recommend that. Um, and then, yeah, check out Joining Forces with Your Brain. And, uh, we've got the first five, first five chapters, the pilot, the pilot chapters are already out. And the next chapters of the series will be out hopefully by late spring of 2023. So soon. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. We'll, we'll link to that with within in the episode description. So anybody that's listening to this, you can check that out after the after the conversation. So Lauren, I want to say a huge thank you for uh, sharing some of your your knowledge and wisdom with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and and learning from you. So um yeah, Likewise. thanks a million, and I want to wish you, you wish you the best with the 
with the launch of the course too or no one's not exactly. a course but the, the program the journey <laughs> the journey the evolution of journey like the learning evolution so however you want to see it i'm just i was such a lovely conversation with you and i'm really looking forward to joining forces with my brain a little bit more moving forward thank you very much lauren all the best you are